The 1950s was a fine decade for sports cars. In 10 years, styling, engineering and performance evolved at a breathtaking pace as the austerity of the post-war era began to recede. The public had a newfound appetite for style, power and sophistication. And the cars of the day reflected that sense of freedom. We could, of course, create an entire list just featuring the 250 and 275 Ferraris, but then we'd be pretty boring. So here are the best sports cars of the 50s that aren't Ferraris. Mike Hawthorne, Juan Manuel Fangio, Jean Bearer. When drivers like these choose a particular car as their own personal transport, you know it's something special. Named in Lancia's fashion after a Roman road, the Aurelia used the world's first production V6 engine, an all-alloy jewel designed under the auspices of legendary engineer Vittorio Jano. This was mated to an innovative transaxle, which combined the gearbox, clutch, diff, and inboard drum brakes, so basically everything, into one unit. The Aurelia was also the first car to be fitted as standard with radial tyres. There was a handsome saloon, the B12, but it was the B20 with its Gia-designed and Pininfarina-built fastback body that is regarded as the first grand touring car, as its initials attest. The Aurelia proved formidable in competition, winning its class in the 1951 24 Hours of Le Mans, taking the first three spots in the 1952 Targa Florio and victory in the 1953 Liège-Rome-Liège trial. In fact, so beloved is the B20 that even the Duke of Richmond himself owns one, so it must be pretty good. With the 550, Ferdinand Porsche revisited the mid-engine layout he had pioneered with the Auto Union Grand Prix cars of the 1930s for the first post-war sports car to bear his name. The engine was quite something. An all-alloy, air-cooled, four-cylinder boxer with double overhead camshafts, twin carbs and dual ignition. It sounds like the kind of thing Porsche used today. But it was 1953 so it produced 110 horsepower and 89 pound-foot of torque. It immediately won classes at Le Mans and the Carrera Panamericana, the latter victory, by the way, being the reason Porsches carry the Carrera badge to this very day. The Porsche 550 was also notoriously the car in which James Dean lost his life. The actor collided with a Ford Tudor driven by 23-year-old Donald Turnipseed, while on his way to the Salinas Road Race event of the 1st and 2nd of October, 1955. A keen amateur racer, Dean had originally ordered a Lotus Mark 9, but bought the Porsche after the Hethel car was delayed. Dean had the car customised by famous customiser George Barris, who painted the nickname Little Bastard on the tail. The Porsche 356 was to the Volkswagen Beetle what the Healey 100 was to the Austin A90 Atlantic, a bulbous two-door which tried, and failed, to sell 50s American styling to British buyers. Former Monte Carlo rally winner Donald Healey had been producing high-end hand-built cars under his own name since just after the war, but wanted a mass-market model. Hitting on the A90 as the donor car, Healy designed the rakish 100 around its mechanicals. The design impressed Austin boss Leonard Lord, and a deal was done to jointly build the Austin Healy 100. The 100, by the way, stands for the fact that the Healy could do, wait for it, 100 miles an hour. Imaginative times. That big number was reached thanks to a 2.6-litre four-cylinder engine, and three-speed with overdrive manual gearbox. The bodies were produced and trimmed by Jensen in West Bromwich, and the mechanicals installed at Austin's Longbridge plant. Yes, that Longbridge. A run of five lightweight 100S models were built, with aluminium bodies and cylinder heads, bumpers and convertible top removed, and a cut-down windscreen made of plastic. Intended for racing, 
these were also the first production cars to feature all-round disc brakes. Sadly, an Austin Healey 100S was involved in motorsport's greatest tragedy, the 1955 Le Mans crash, when one was rear-ended by Pierre Levesque's Mercedes, which was launched into the crowd, killing 84 people, including its driver. Car dealers don't always get a say in how the models they sell get developed, but US luxury car importer Max Hoffman had a hand in many. Hoffman suggested to Mercedes-Benz that a road-going version of its Le Mans and Carrera Panamericana winning W194 racer would be a hit with well-heeled Americans. The 300SL, for super light, used the same construction techniques as the racer, albeit mainly in steel rather than aluminium. It was necessity rather than style that led to the iconic gullwing doors. The tube frame underneath the body panels was so large that the ESL had massive sides, meaning conventional doors were impossible. The road car used the same 3-litre overhead cam straight 6 as the W194, canted over to 50 degrees for that low bonnet line. Unusually, the engine was much more powerful in fuel-injected road trim, producing 243 horsepower to the racer's 177 and making the 300SL the fastest production car in the world on its release. Here is another Hoffman-inspired entry, which the dealer persuaded BMW to build because he wanted a cheaper convertible to sell alongside the 300SL Cabriolet. Hoffman envisaged the car being half the price of the Merc and selling in its thousands. So BMW designed it around as many existing components as possible. The chassis was adapted from the BMW 502 Saloon and its 3.2 litre V8, which, with twin carburetors, produced 150 horsepower. Hoffman also insisted the car be designed by Albrecht von Goetz, a designer friend of his with an interesting history. He later designed a grand piano for Steinway and Sons, and claimed to have worked for Porsche, but apparently never did. The result was undoubtedly pleasing, but proved to be a challenge to build, each one being hand-formed from aluminium, so no two cars are identical. This meant the price almost doubled, leading to only 252 cars being sold and nearly bankrupting BMW. Two of those cars were owned by Elvis Presley, however, and another one was gifted to John Surtees by Count Augusta for winning his company the 1956 500cc World Motorcycle Championship. The Jaguar XKSS was conceived as a way to make use of unused chassis from the D-Type competition programme, recouping their development cost. In converting it to a road car, the XKSS gained a passenger door, a windscreen and side screens, but lost the D-Type's glorious fin along with the rear bodywork and the divider between the driver and passenger seats. A properly trimmed cabin and a rudimentary convertible top added a modicum of refinement, while bumpers and larger Jaguar XK140 rear lights helped increase safety, at least as much as safety was a thing in 1957. In total, 25 cars were planned, but on the 12th of February 1957, Jaguar's Browns Lane factory caught fire, destroying the final nine, although two of them were later created using existing D-types. Most of the remaining 16 were sold in America, including one to actor Steve McQueen, who referred to it as the Green Rat. In 2016, Jaguar resumed production, finally finishing those last nine cars. Is there any company that is able to do so much with such seemingly humble components as Lotus? Case in point, the 1.2 litre Coventry Climax engine originally used in the little Lotus Elite was normally found working the water pump on a fire engine. With it, the Elite won its class at Le Mans six times. Yes, six water pump powered wins. 
Unveiled in 1957, the Elite was the first production car to feature a fiberglass monocoque forming the body and load-bearing structures of the car. As a result, the car weighed just 500 kilograms, helping it to two index of thermal efficiency wins at Le Mans as well. Pretty quick, and with sublime handling, the Elite was also fragile, with suspension points pulling away from the monocoque and suffering from persistent vibrations. Just over a thousand were produced from 1958 to 1963. 